Do you ever watch a cartoon and think, wow, that would probably make a really cool live action movie? If only they would get the right people, it could be really awesome. Well, imagine if like that didn't happen or did happen and it was just too super weird for mainstream audiences to accept. Sometimes cartoons can make for the perfect source material for a live action movie, but other times it lends itself to our list. I'm Jim Gisriel for Frederator and today we're going to count down eight disastrous live action adaptations of animation. Number 8 Speed Racer. Although I personally love the Speed Racer movie, my retinas still haven't recovered from the life-changing experience of seeing it in the IMAX, it's no doubt this was a huge financial disaster. Making only 43 million domestically with a reported budget of 120 million, making it the first movie from the Wachowskis not to make money, although it certainly wasn't the last. But Speed Racer is a movie with unique and crazed vision, really bringing the color and fun energy of a cartoon to a live-action film with dazzling and one-of-a-kind special effects. Stephen Colbert best described the experience of watching Speed Racer as put 80 pounds of fireworks into an industrial dryer, crawl right in there with them, turn it on, and then light the fuse. Although this movie is a bit of a mess, it's a bit of a mess that you can root for because of its rare kind of kids film with an auteur vision. I always wondered how anyone thought this could even do well and also wished we lived in a world where maybe it could. Number 7. Popeye. Robert Altman's 1980 adaptation of Popeye is more on this list for reputation than actually being a disaster. If you ask most people, if they've even heard of this movie, about Popeye, they consider it a cinematic flop, and although it didn't make as much as maybe the studio wanted, it actually was successful. The movie was originally produced when Paramount Pictures lost a bidding war with Columbia for the musical Annie. After Paramount lost, producer Robert Evans asked in a meeting what other comic strip characters did they have the rights to, and one person at the meeting said, Popeye. The miscommunication of how the public viewed Popeye was really part of the problem here. Popeye originally first appeared in the comic strip Thimble Theater by E.C. Seeger. After Popeye, a minor character became incredibly popular ten years into the comic strip's run, Popeye went from a minor character to the lead and main focus of Thimble Theater. The film was really more based on the Popeye comic strip and only slightly the classic Fleischer and famous studio cartoons, but most of the public then and even now are far more familiar with Popeye as a cartoon character, making it more of a disaster in terms of what version of Popeye they chose to adapt, but also this movie is really weird and uneven. As much as I love to see Robert Altman making a big budget movie, it's still really too out there for a mainstream audience to really get into. Number 6, Aeon Flux. Peter Chung's Aeon Flux was known for its action-filled, surreal, heavy metal magazine-like animation. A staple of MTV in the liquid television era, and when MTV would actually still play cartoons, let alone music videos, Aeon Flux seemed perfect for a big screen adaptation until you realized what made Aeon Flux so distinctive was its unique style of animation. In live action, all of that is gone, giving us a poorly directed, futuristic action movie. Although it is Charlize Theron's first action action movie role post her Oscar win for Best Actress, it wouldn't be until later she would perfect her action movie persona. This confused, misbegotten, big budget property missed what made the show so distinctive, and left most critics and audiences wondering why she got that fly caught in her eyelashes, something the stylish show never had to answer because of its odd and trippy animation style. Number 5, The Flintstones, Viva Rock Vegas. What do you do if you want to make a sequel to a major hit and its big star wants nothing to do with it? Well, you make a prequel reboot, of course. After John Goodman refused to come back for a sequel to 1994's The Flintstones, Universal decided to make a prequel reboot with a whole new cast to continue the franchise. They probably should have known they were in trouble since they refused to make the original unless John Goodman would play Fred Flintstone but decided this time it would probably be okay. They probably should have also known they were in trouble as soon as lesser Flintstone characters like the Great Kazoo were involved. Viva Rock Vegas opened with such a big bang it put any of Universal's future Flintstone franchise plans on ice, and they've never made another one since. Number 4, The Rocky and Bullwinkle Movie. 
One of the most beloved and well-known cartoons of all time, Rocky and Bullwinkle has spawned big film hits like George of the Jungle and Mr. Peabody and Sherman, but also major misses like Dudley Do-Right and the Boris and Natasha movie. Rocky and Bullwinkle sadly belongs with the latter rather than the former, with cutting edge CG for the time, or well, sorta cutting edge CG. I mean, they, they tried their best, I'm, I'm assuming, I guess, you know? to try and bring Rocky and Bullwinkle from the cartoon world to the real world, but instead it ends up looking like the poop rat from Food Fight. In addition to terrible hammy performances by Jason Alexander and Rene Russo, it was one of the most embarrassing performances of Robert De Niro's career, which is really saying something, even quoting his famous taxi driver scene as fearless leader. This is one of the most groan-inducing attempts at bringing a cartoon to the live-action world, and audiences agreed by pretty much not seeing it at all or even talking about it ever again. Number 3, Dragon Ball Evolution. Dragon Ball was most American audiences' first introduction to anime, which made it a perfect choice for a big screen adaptation. Unfortunately, what we got was so bad and disastrous, the screenwriter recently publicly apologized by saying, I dropped the Dragon Ball. Missing the point of the show Dragon Ball, which was the fights, and getting stuck with the wrong director, James Wong, director of Final Destination, over their first choice and probably the best choice turned producer of the film, Stephen Chow, this film had a lot of problems, not to mention the whitewashing of Goku into an Aaron Paul looking mopey teenager. They took the original series and turned it into a bland 2000s high school superhero movie that strayed so far from the original series you wonder if the writer even liked the original show. And it turns out in his recent apology, you're right, he didn't. Number 2, Gem and the Holograms. Probably best described as Gem in name only, as this has nothing to do with the original show other than character names, and doesn't even have the misfits at all, except in a post credit scene featuring Kesha, this unwatchable, unfaithful adaptation alienated most of the fans of the original Gem show, by having nothing to do with the original and appealing solely to kids who had no real clue who Gem even was. Director John M. Chu chose to make this film for a lower budget than what the studio had pitched him so he could get full creative control, thus not making the more faithful adaptation that the studio originally intended. This was a costly mistake, as Gem and the Holograms made only two million and was pulled from theaters after only two weeks, something that almost never happens in Hollywood anymore. This movie was so empty, it disappeared just like the hologram it was or wasn't since there aren't actually any holograms in this movie except the band who aren't actual holograms. And of course, the number one disastrous live action remake is The Last Airbender. Although widely considered one of the worst movies ever made, The Last Airbender actually made 131 million in America, more than Pulp Fiction, and 319 million worldwide, probably more than Citizen Kane 2, and actually made more money than any other film on this list. But its negative reputation was enough to ruin what was left of M. Night Shyamalan's already flimsy filmography of stinkers. This movie was so bad it actually sent M. Night to director jail despite it doing okay. He didn't even direct another movie after this until 2013's After Earth which itself was an actual box office bomb. Most of the time the general public is indifferent toward how well adapted live action adaptations of animation are, but this was so bad it ruined any good Will M. Night still had left. When the trailer for a film he produced, Devil, came out that fall, it was met with laughter when his name came up on the screen. With a major mishandling of the material and whole plot points just simply explained by characters, The Last Airbender has gone down as one of the worst adaptations of really anything ever. That and a terrible last minute 3D conversion that made this bad movie even worse somehow. And with critic quotes like, The Last Airbender is an agonizing experience in every category I can think of, and others still waiting to be invented. Roger Ebert. Wow, this makes Dragon Ball Evolution look like a masterpiece. It was really one of the worst received movies in recent memory with a 6% on Rotten Tomatoes. Although M. Night came back with The Visit this past fall, Hollywood will probably not let him do another big budget film like The Last Airbender again, leaving a horrible stain on the idea of live action adaptations of animation and the gold standard example of what not to do for both live action remakes and all of cinema in general. 
This was eight disastrous live action adaptations of animation. If you can think of any other horrible disasters that have been adapted from your favorite cartoons, please let us know in the comments. I was Jim Gisriel. Check out my reviews of current releases, animation, and classic films, as well as my new show, Deep Focus, where I talk about issues related to animation and film. Thank you very much for watching, and Frederator loves you.